It was June 25, 1941, when President Roosevelt issued an executive order allowing African Americans to join the United States Marine Corps. What these brave recruits didn't know was that they'd be going to a segregated boot camp called Montford Point near Jacksonville, North Carolina. 20,000 plus Negroes went through Montford Point, a segregated boot camp. Archie Robinson from Louisiana was one of them. I was in college and this Marine came aboard campus First time I, I really I heard, had heard talk of, of Marines, those dress blues drew me in like still draw a lot of young kids in then. Wanting his own flashy uniform, Robinson joined in 1946. He was only 17 and needed parental consent. Instead, he secretly forged their signatures. My parents thought I was still in college, but I used to write letters to my buddies in college and then they would forward to my parents. He faced much more than intense training. He faced racism. We were treated like dirt. We weren't human beings. We got second-hand gear that the white Marines didn't want or couldn't use. And working in the kitchen and as a waiter to white officers was not what this feisty teenager had in mind. They didn't refer to us as Marine, I need some more coffee, it was boy, boy this and boy that. I used to miss pouring coffee on the cup, pour coffee on the hand, so I burnt this little basset, and he stood up, and I, at that point, I didn't give a damn anymore. I flattened him. Facing a court-martial, his colonel let it slide, giving him a few days in the brig instead. He saved me, otherwise I'd have been going to Leavenworth. Still hoping to prove that patriotism was colorblind, Robinson's father told him to persevere. He says, just stand your ground. It's not gonna always be like this. It was in me to show the white man that I was just as good as he was. Three years later, he'd get his chance on the front lines in Korea. The Marines now fully integrated, Corporal Robinson was a rifle platoon sergeant in charge of 39 men, most of them white. When we, we got there, you were just another American Marine. They felt by me in the same way I felt about them. We is going to protect each other. Now he faced the enemy on the battlefield. 24 hours of the day, you taught to kill, kill, or you is going to be killed. You have to be on your feet from, uh, 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 you never know when you're going to be attacked. He was attacked. A grenade went off in his face. He still has shrapnel in his nose today. When I go through the airport, it sets it off. But that was just the beginning. During intense shelling in another battle, Robinson was hit again. That was my birthday. Well, they picked a, <laughs> that day for us to make the raid. I don't know. I remember when I first got shot, but it was just a clean wound. But the, the mortar round is what did the, the job on me. He spent five months in a coma. From February to July, I don't remember anything. He earned two Purple Hearts for those near-death encounters, something he's not particularly proud of. I call it the dumb metal. When the enemy outsmarts you, you're dumb. And there would be more battles ahead as Robinson went on to serve two tours in Vietnam. Six, eight, zero, one, zero, zero. Stop. Now promoted to Sergeant Major, Robinson came face to face with the enemy when he was unarmed. I didn't have my weapon with me because I would have shot him. And, but we were so close, I reached and I grabbed his rifle and jerked it out of his hand and beat him to death. The F-4, a fighter plane fast enough to break the sound barrier, 
Sally Ann Eves has flown in one, breaking barriers of her own. We did 1.5 mock. That was exciting. That was back in 1968, a year after she joined the Air Force. When I came into the Air Force, women couldn't be pilots. But they could work in administration. And over the course of 35 years, Sally Eves rose from second lieutenant to brigadier general, a true milestone for women in the military. And normally, I was the only woman in a squadron. She managed Air Force squadrons from Libya to Thailand to Germany, taking care of hundreds of airmen at a time. When she became general, she went to Langley Air Force Base in Virginia in charge of logistics, combat weapons systems, and maintenance. I think I was the first female general there. There were some reserve generals who did not think that I could cope in that masculine world. I was very comfortable in that world. It was a world of all men, yet she always seemed to fit in. I love NASCAR, I love football. She also loves visiting the Wings Over the Rockies Air and Space Museum in Denver, where she now volunteers. This kind of reminds you of home. This certainly does. Yeah, most of the bases I was assigned to had F-4s. The F-4 housed here also reminds her of her late husband, Steve. Steve Eves was the navigator on the plane. He sat behind the pilot. Pilot, in your plane. He was awarded the Silver Star when he shot down a MiG in the Vietnam War on May 10, 1972. Bogey, one, zero, left, four, five. So the MiG that, that Steve got credit for shooting down, it was a missile that was under the wing. Steve was a lieutenant colonel when he retired, which meant Sally could pull rank. He used to offer to polish my shoes. <laughs> they were married for 36 years. He died in 2010. It's kind of hard. It's bittersweet. I'm proud of everybody who's ever been in the F4 and what they did, but I keep thinking about Steve. There's a brick outside the museum donated by Sally and her husband, Steve. I miss the Air Force. She's proud of her service. She's lived in seven countries and eight states and is the mother of three boys. When I would come back to Denver, I'm Sally. You know, I'm a housewife, mother. And so every once in a while, I kind of, when I sit and think about that Brigadier General, I thought, it's awesome. <laughs> Sally hopes to inspire other women thinking about joining the military. I would like to talk to every one of them and, and um, hope that their parents and their schools have taught them to respect themselves and to be confident. There's such a great world out there for them. I look at the young ones going in and, and I just say, oh, I wish I could do it over again. Commanding the skies over Europe, the 10-man teams and the B-17 bombers put their lives on the line to help win the war against Germany. I think going over to England and flying out of the 8th Air Force on bombing runs in the 43 and early 44 was probably about as dangerous a thing you could do. If you lost the plane, you lost 10 people, and they were losing planes like hundreds. Despite the danger, Chet Cromwell, a veteran from Arvada, trained hard to learn to fly them. I really wanted to be a pilot because I'd flown model airplanes and made them, and, and I was really into airplanes. <laughs> But despite scoring high on pilot training tests, the Air Force indiscriminately took half his team out of the pilot program. They had too many people in pilot training, and that's how they chose to separate us out. Oh, was that disappointing. 
So he did the next best thing and became a flight engineer on a B-17. He was in the plane, part of the 10-man crew, ready to troubleshoot any mechanical or electrical problems in mid-flight. Which one's you? Uh, right to there. <laughs> okay. But again, Cromwell would be disappointed. He was never called into action. It bothered me a lot because I felt I was trained and ready and I'd like to do my job. After the war, he chose another job, teaching at North Arvada Middle School. His passion for science and engineering led to an invention to help save time in the classroom. I put together a, a little box that fits on the student's desk and a big console for the teacher. That's a young Chet Cromwell featured in a local newspaper showing his device. The box had a red and a green light in it and a selector switch so the kid could answer a question by saying, oh, that's answer number five and press it. And, and if he gets a green light, I got it. And I remember kids who uh, would jump out of their seat and say, I got it. <laughs> uh, I swear, that was one thing I learned from that project was kids really, every kid got involved. This was the idea behind the whole thing. It would save me grading papers and I wouldn't have to give quizzes. I could do the questions right there in class appropriately right after we had discussed something. The idea finally caught on and it's being used. If you'd look on the internet and do a little Googling of um, teacher, student, feedback machines or systems, you'd find that all over the country people are using these. About 20 years later, Cromwell was at the forefront of another local invention, solar energy. One day at his home on Kipling Street, he noticed how hot the bricks were outside, even on a winter day. All at once, this epiphany, this this sense of, I could put glass over this and let that brick heat up the air and blow it from the basement into the bedrooms and around through the house and around and around. And we could get a lot of heat out of that. It took him a few months to build a solar system and soon after cut his energy bill by 75%. My use of gas in terms of 100 cubic feet Again, newspapers featured Cromwell and his breakthrough. And it gave him another opportunity to share his love of science with children. Kids would walk by and say, oh, what's that all about? And they'd want to know what it was, and I'd tell them about it. Chet Cromwell is 88 years old. His service in the military was an important part of his life. He was willing to fight and die for his country. That one was a full population effort to stop the Hitler's drive. And uh, I was very proud and glad to be a part of it. The way he charted his life after the war reflects that strong sense of service. You feel like you've left your mark a little bit? <laughs> Well, yeah, <laughs> I think in some ways.